Okay, so we will be doing a live Q&A here with Dr. Bully. Um, and so first, before we get started, we want to introduce everybody that's on the panel here. Um, and some of us will be asking the questions. Um, so if we want to start with all the way to the left, if Mason, you want to go. Hi, I'm Mason. Um, I'm Officer of Advertising and Branding for Idea Student Society. Hi, I'm Janina. I am the VP of Communications for Idea Student Society. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm the VP of Operations for Idea Student Society. And I'm Alexandria, and I'm the president of Idea Student Society. Um, in the center, we have Dr. Bully, obviously. <laughs> so we yeah, he wanted me to go. <laughs> yeah, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I am an associate teaching professor here at ASU. Uh, this is I've been I've been here for two years, but I was here for a long time as a student. Um, this is where I I've gotten basically all my degrees. Um, so my uh, my first degree is in justice studies, uh, and that was super fun and really I feel like made me um, a kinder human, and it really taught me to listen to people and. Uh, which feels like a skill that I probably should have already had, but um, then uh, came back for physics and got a bachelor's, master's, and, and PhD in physics. So um, I'm really happy to, to be here. I'm also serving as the EDI uh, point person for the Department of Physics, and it's just, it's just a really fun job that um, doesn't exist in uh, I didn't realize existed that I get to teach and pursue EDI efforts and, and I really love it. All right, uh, what classes do you teach at ASU and what are your favorite classes topics to teach? Uh, so I teach um, a in the fall I teach an intro course that is really just kind of a, a seminar where we bring in a lot of guest speakers for freshmen. Uh, physics students to help them understand what can you do with a physics degree and what do you have to do now to get where you want to be. Um, so we, we have a lot of really interesting guest speakers uh, from the university, from industry, uh, even a couple people who have taken their physics degree and gone kind of the entrepreneurial route and, and gone completely outside of physics, but are still using the skills, the problem solving skills that they learned in physics. So that's a really interesting class. Um, and in the spring, I, I have been teaching sec, uh, physics two, uh, but I'll be teaching physics one this spring. And, uh, and in both semesters, I teach, um, a, it's called Sundial. And it's a mentoring program for physics, as well as uh, the School of um, Earth and Space Exploration. So graduate students and upper division undergraduates mentor freshmen and sophomores. And that can be in, in mentoring and research or just mentoring kind of as they go through the college experience. And uh, it's a really great community. And then I also... Um, developed, I think that the reason I'm here is I uh, I created a class for research in scanning electron microscopy, which was what I did. That was my undergraduate research uh, as well. So that's uh, super fun. And, uh, and Mason was my student and, and uh, Nicolette's giving a heart right there. Um, so I've had really great, uh, really awesome online students. It was a great online class. Like, yay. It was, I loved it because it's a research experience for online students who so that's typically really hard and B, it's cool stuff. Like, it's not just like, oh, someone to slap on a CV that you're like, meh, whatever. Like, it's actually so cool. It's super fun. Um, so as far as like what my favorite class is, um, I mean, that one has a special place in my heart because I made it. Uh, but I would have to say actually physics 101 is my favorite class. And that's the class that I teach uh, at community colleges actually every summer. And I have taught it, I think this is my 23rd time uh, teaching it. And it, I love it because 
students come in afraid of physics and they leave at the end of the semester, um, not only not afraid, but also seeing physics everywhere in their lives. Um, so I, I think that's, that's, that's my favorite class. And because also because we get to touch on, we do really, it's really surface level, obviously, but we get to touch on almost all parts of physics. So, um, so you get to teach everything and that's a lot of fun. That sounds really awesome. That sounds fun. Um, okay. So besides the degrees that you've already told us about, what other degrees do you hold and what did your higher education journey look like to get those degrees? Uh, so those are my only degrees. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I went into justice studies out of high school um, and I actually started pre-med, uh, but I, so I always wanted to be a physician who wrote like murder mystery novels. Um, so the, from the, t I, I don't even remember like a time when that, when that wasn't what I wanted to do. And uh, so that was always my, my path. And when I got to college, uh, but uh, so, so I chose justice studies because I thought that it was going to help me write murder mystery novels. And then turns out it was a lot of social justice. And like I said, really kind of made me into a kinder human, um, and I really loved, I really loved in that program that we got to look at a lot of issues from really like a three dimensional perspective. Um, and I learned to center voices of people experiencing injustice rather than all of us just looking in and being like, we know your lives better than you do. Um, so it was, that it was a really important, um, it was a really important experience for me and informing who I, I am. Um, and also kind of during that time, well, even, even in high school, I, I like checked out a book from the library on television writing. And I didn't even realize that that was like a thing. Like I knew it was fiction, but it just didn't occur to me that like, that's a job that someone writes that. And when I found that out, I was like, that is what I want to do. So I kind of gradually moved from, um, transitioned away from pre-med towards um, TV writing, but I did take all the pre-med courses. So I took a bunch of science and I took uh, chemistry beyond, beyond the pre-med requirements. Um, but when I graduated, uh, so I had like a chemistry minor uh, and, and I guess it's important at this point to say, I really fell in love with quantum chemistry. So like um, quantum chemistry is basically the math of an atom and math and imagination are like two of my absolute favorite things. Um, so, so while I was in college, even though I was transitioning kind of away from medicine, um, I, I really fell in love with quantum chemistry. So uh, I did move to LA for a couple of years, just in time for a recession and a writer's strike uh, and almost ran out of money came back uh, because I was like, that's okay. I know what I want to do. I want to do quantum. Um, so, so I did, but I went quantum physics instead of quantum chemistry. And so in, in my first semester back, uh, I was lucky enough to be in a class taught by Professor David Smith and who is, uh, I did not, I had no idea at the time, but is one of like the most preeminent electron microscopists in the world. And, um, but I didn't know that because uh, he, he's very humble. He doesn't act like it. And so it was very not intimidating for me to go to him and say, can I, um, can I do research with you? Can I, you know, get some undergraduate experience? And, uh, and I joined that group thinking that I would La that I would like do it for three months and then move on to something else and try a bunch of different things and see what I liked. Um, but I joined that group and I never left. Um, and that's uh, eventually where I got my PhD as well. So that's that's a winding journey, but that's my educational journey. <laughs> I love that. Um, so what inspired you to go all the way to a PhD in your field? Um, it was the careers that I wanted. I wanted to be able to teach um, at, at the highest levels and, and you need a P actually at the community college, you only need a master's degree. And there was a time when I thought maybe that's, maybe I'll stop there. Um, 
but uh, but I'm also kind of an overachiever as well. And and I had a lot of people telling me, like, go all the way. So I had a really good support system. Do you have any like regrets about going all the way or are you like completely satisfied? I'm really glad that I did because I wouldn't be in the place that I am now without, okay. without that. I don't think it's for everyone, um, but it, it was necessary to do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. How does being the EDI person for the physics department at ASU impact your teaching and goals for your students? So I, th I think, again, I think what mostly changed me is not so much being the EDI person, but going through that experience of justice studies. Um, but but I would say getting get what 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 being the EDI point person allows me to do is spend more time learning and listening. Um, it, it just you know there's there's time allotted for me to to do EDI instead of having to tack it on to a full time teaching position. Um, so so I would say that the main way it impacts is I've been able to learn more. You know what students um, are facing and. Um, and be able to be more sensitive to that and, uh, and, and incorporate that into policy as well. Uh, what has being an educator changed about how you view and interact with the world? I, so I want to pause here and I want to say like, I love these questions. They're so deep and like uh, <laughs> you gave them to me in advance, which is great when we get to the last one. Um, but I was just so happy to get them. Um, so I, I think I think that it has made me um, give people the benefit of the doubt more and be less judgmental because I see um, I, I see a, a lot of people really trying. And I think, especially like in Physics 101, I'm well, I shouldn't say that in all my classes, but Physics 101 is what I, I think what, that's what happened first. So that's probably what changed my view. Um, is they are so enthusiastic. And I think it also has made me see how much kind of the world beats us down and how much there really is curiosity and uh, in deep in, in us that just really wants to come out. And given the right environment, I think we all really want to be curious and open and um, not defensive. And and I think the the best the best of us can come out in a classroom um, in the right environment. Um, but I think there are also lots of classrooms that could further beat us down. So um, I, th I think that's really changed is how I see people. Um, and I also think just trying to communicate things. I see that differently. Um, that I, I think just just like what people what what people need to hear. I, I think like I try to again, especially in physics 101, but I probably shouldn't say that because it's in every class. I really try to find the space in someone's brain that they can connect to new pieces of information. And, uh, and a lot of times that's everyday life. And a lot of times I really make students find that piece of their brain for themselves. Um, so, you know, I have a, a, an assignment called scavenger hunts where students have to go out and find uh, whatever the topic is that we are learning about in their everyday lives. And I'm amazed at what they come back with. And it's stuff that I never would be able to um, just stand in front of a lectern and say, here's how it relates to you. Uh, it's much better to say, you, you tell me how it relates to you. Um, and, and I think then kind of applying this to maybe social justice issues, I think I'm really trying to think about how do we find the space in people's brain to connect some new information? Um, because I, there are a lot of environments, I think, the, the environment that I grew up in really doesn't, doesn't 
allow for that space. Um, and so, so, so where do you connect? Where do you connect with people? Um, and I don't think there's a universal answer for that, but, but I think it's a question worth continuing to ask. That's kind of where I am right now. I love, I love that answer. Me that, too. Like, that makes me so happy, especially because like as somebody who has gone through the awful STEM courses where they just want to beat us down, like it makes me happy that there's other new professors coming out of their PhDs who want to change STEM education and want to stop making everyone fight each other, figure out who's the smartest with the most money and just understand that if we all work together, we can do great things. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need to be top 1% of your class to be a great scientist, you know, like. It wasn't, I, yeah. I consider myself to be a very average uh, physics student. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I, and there, and there are a lot of us like, um, and and I'm so pleased that ASU is is hiring these people. Like we we really been like that is really a, a um, something that we are looking for when we hire new people into the physics department. Very exciting time. Absolutely. Um. Oh, outside of education, uh, what do you like to do for fun? What's your biggest hobbies? My my favorite thing to do of all time is to play drums. Um. I've been playing for about 28 years and uh, it's, yeah, it's my favorite thing. Anytime drumsticks are in my hand, uh, happy chemicals are going off in my brain. Um, so I play, I play like um, once a year. Uh, I, I should probably find a way to perform more often, but, uh, but I perform once a year in a, uh, a concert called Drums for Toilets. Uh, and it's on World Toilet Day. So the UN created World Toilet Day. This is our 10th anniversary, actually. So in 2013, the UN created World Toilet Day. Um, and it is to, to raise awareness that uh, of the need for sanitation worldwide. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's the number two uh, di diarrheal diseases, I think, are the number two killer of children under the age of five worldwide. Um, when girls uh, reach puberty and uh, and start menstruating, they often have to drop out of school um, or at least miss those days, which then sets them behind uh, if there aren't proper facilities at the school. And uh, and uh, women and girls in places where there aren't safe facilities to use often face the threat of rape when they go out to just relieve themselves. And those are all really horrible. And I have digestive a digestive condition myself, and um, I felt like I had to like do something. So so the UN created to raise awareness, but also to fix the problem. Um, so uh, so drums for toilets. Uh, raises money for latrines, mostly in mostly in schools in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, yeah, so drumming is my favorite thing, and of course, I, I like to write also, and I'm I'm trying to to work on that. I was gonna say, do you still like do a lot of writing to this day, or I do. I kind I had to set it aside a little bit. Um, in grad school, I was also teaching uh, like more than full time. So yeah, school's brutal. It, yeah. And uh, so it, it got kind of put in the background, but it's coming back out. So I'm I'm about I'm actually like I just hit the halfway point of of a novel. So oh have you published I, anything yet or will that be your first? No, this this would be the first. Yay! Really exciting. I'm excited. <laughs> um if you could meet anyone in the world, dead or alive. Who would you choose and why? You can have a physics person or another person or both. Okay. This was the hardest one. I've been thinking about this like all week. And I feel like I had an answer at one point in my life. And I don't know. I, um, but I think that I think that I'm going to give two answers. I think that I'm going to say my two favorite scientists are Catherine Hayhoe and Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Um, they're both climate scientists. And they both also do science communication. And I would just like to sit at a table and learn from them. Nice. So what's your favorite physics experiment and why? 
uh, the one that helped me get my PhD. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I, um, so electron microscopes, the transmission electron microscopes are the ones that often take up the size of a room. Um, many of them can image individual atoms uh, and they use electron, all of them use electrons instead of light to do the imaging. So my, my, um, all my projects looked at uh, Im imaged uh, photovoltaics, which is basically solar cell technology, solar panel technology, and kind of looking at almost what would, what are some possibilities for like next gen materials that would be in solar panels. So there was one experiment in particular where we imaged, it, it was a certain interface of two materials. So it was um, gallium phosphide grown on silicon. And um, I won't get into all the details, but basically we were the first people to image that at the atomic level. Um, so there, and there, it, it was really important because there was, there's one, um, really big kind of problem that happens at not only that interface, but similar interfaces. And there were a lot of theories about why this problem happens um, and what does it cause. Um, but, and there were, it had been studied from a lot of different ways, but we were the first ones to actually visualize that at the atomic level. And we were able to confirm some theories and, or sorry, not confirm, um, support. Uh, so theories and also, uh, uh, say, no, these others kind of don't really fit. So what you're saying is that you're trying to get all of your research class people to be a you. I love it. You're trying to get them to love exactly what you love. Yes. That is yeah, the, pretty much. The best, I'm sharing the, the love. Kind of, that's the best kind of teacher too. Like the one that just wants you to appreciate what they do, even if you don't end up studying it, but you can appreciate yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Love, that's so love the electron. That's also cool that you like were one of the first ones to do that. Like that's that's major. That's really big. Like I mean, that's that's what scientific discovery is. Is that feeling of like, whoa, I'm the first one to whatever fill in the blank. Um, and it's really there was really no feeling like it when. I remember actually, I think I was still an undergraduate and and I was using the SEM, but I would also prepare specimens using this particular instrument um, that actually ended up being my favorite microscope. Um, and then uh, and then my advisor would uh, would look at them and, and a lot of times, he, most of the time, if I if I was available, he would let me like look over his shoulder. And I remember one time he said, we are probably the first like people to see this particular um, combination of materials in the world. And like, there's no feeling like that, uh, the, the, that feeling of scientific discovery and knowing that like, this is some part of nature that has existed and you, it, it's almost like it is like sharing itself with you and you get to, you have this privilege of witnessing it uh, and being the first to witness it. Like there's, there's really no feeling like that wish that feeling on all of you whatever you feel this <laughs> absolutely I'll, I'll take all of that <laughs> yeah exactly that sounds amazing we will all take all that we can get <laughs> mm -hmm. so on to the little fun questions and tidbits um if you could compare yourself to any animal um which would you like to be and why and you can always throw in hybrids mixes whatever you wish it's going to be 110 here in Phoenix uh, over the weekend. So my favorite animal is the penguin um, and I'm kind of living vicariously through them right now. But I kind of have always related to the penguin in that they're pretty awkward, uh, just kind of, you know, the way they walk. And, and sometimes they, they even go fastest, like when they just drop down and they slide on their bellies. Um, but when they get into the water, it's like an entirely different, uh, like an entirely different animal almost to the way they could glide and stuff. And um, they're really in their elements and it's really beautiful. And I think uh, I've related to the awkwardness a long time. And um, 
really over the pandemic, I've been doing a lot of work on myself and I am learning to also accept the beautiful parts of myself. Um, so I think a penguin. I love nice. that. I love that, especially because my favorite animal is a puffin, which is Probably basically totally the same thing. <laughs> not, but I mean, I wasn't going to say animal wise because that's not true at all. <laughs> they look very similar. They do. They do. If you could teach or study physics anywhere in the world, where would you, where would your dream place be and why? I'm in it. I'm in it right now. Um, <laughs> I actually love Arizona. So I was born here and uh, I'm one of the very few, like everyone I went to high school with couldn't wait to leave. And I like, I'm one of the few that really love it. I love the desert. Um, I'm concerned about drought. I'm concerned whether I'll be able to live here uh, the rest of my life. But, um, but if I can, this is where, you know, this is where I want to be. Um, but I know that's kind of a boring answer. So I was thinking if if I if this were out of the picture, if Arizona were out of the picture, where would I want to go? And I think I think what Arizona is lacking for me um, is that sense of adventure. So it feels like home, but it's very, very comfortable. Um, and so I think I would want some place that really ticks off that sense of adventure for me. So like somewhere where I'd have to learn a new language, um, maybe where the culture is very different, um, some place where I'd really have to kind of um, learn to adapt a lot, learn to do a lot of new things to adapt. Um, I actually was in, uh, I visited some friends in China several years ago and really loved it. And that may just be because everyone I talked to was friends of friends. <laughs> so it was, I, I, you know, everyone there I really enjoyed. Um, but, but I really kind of felt at home there too, uh, in, in, in an interesting way. So maybe, maybe China. Um, I went to Dalian and, uh, and Wuhan. I would think I would have to be on the coast though, because I have very bad allergies. So I would need, I would need somewhere where the air is, uh, with the ocean air. All right. Now comes my favorite question that I have been waiting to ask. Explain Schrodinger's equation, but as someone who has never, but to us as people who have probably never studied physics or looked at the equation before, kind of as if we're like three-year-olds or young children, how would you explain that equation to them? So I want to look at the blue part. Um, so you can see there are three terms and all of these terms are about energy. And uh, I'm not gonna explain energy because if you have ever been around a three-year-old, you know what energy is. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, you know, if you've been in an introductory physics class, you know, there are a couple different types of energy. We have kinetic energy, we have potential energy. And if you haven't been in a physics class, that's okay, because we're gonna talk about it. So we have uh, anything that moves, has energy. Uh, again, think of the three-year-old. Um, that's what this term is. This term is energy of motion. Uh, and so not only do we have energy when we move, but electrons do too. And so this is the electrons kinetic energy uh, term. And uh, we also have another type of energy called potential energy. And so if we can think of like, uh, if we climb a ladder, um, the higher you climb on the ladder, the uh, eventually the faster you're going to be when the more motion you're going to have when you reach the ground. And so you have this potential energy that then transfers into the energy of motion. Um, for an electron, the type of potential energy that it has is uh, because an electron is negatively charged, but there are other things in the atom that have uh, there may be other electrons that are also negatively charged, but it's got protons, which are positively charged. And that's where that energy comes from, is the interaction between the charges. Um, if you've rubbed a balloon in your hair, uh, then you know your hair sticks out. And that's because uh, your hair has all the same type of charge. And so like, like charges, the same type of charge repels. And so your hair is all trying to repel it, um, each other because they have the same type of charge. Um, and then if you have opposite charges, if you have a positive and a negative, 
than they want to attract. Um, it's kind of like every bad romantic comedy uh, that opposites attract. Um, so if you take that balloon and you bring it back towards your hair, now the balloon has the opposite charge as your hair and you'll see the hair wants to drift to the balloon. It's attracted to the balloon. So that, that, that there's energy there, right? Because, uh, because that energy turns into motion. Your hair wants to move away from, uh, away from each other and they want to move towards the balloon. So there's potential energy in those charges. And that's what this term is. Uh, and then if you add those together, you get the total energy. And that's what this term is. And this term represents um, the state of the electron. And so the really interesting thing, uh, so I'm going to pause here and say that one thing that really bothers me, uh, this is kind of my pet peeve and soapbox um, about science communication, is that I feel like too often when it is simplified, they act like that's all there is. Um, and I feel like our culture especially has a tended there there is a tendency to kind of think that um, when we have a little bit of information, we know all that there is to know. And I don't think that that comes from science communication. I think there are other reasons for that misperception, but I don't think science communication is doing us any favors when it when it acts like a little bit of information is all there is to know. So I'm gonna say there is way more to know about this than, uh, than what we're talking about. And if you don't really, if you don't understand math, you don't understand physics, um, which, is, which is okay. You can understand physics at a qualitative level. Not everyone needs to understand the math, um, but we should have some humbleness um, to accept our lack of expertise. Um, so the interesting thing is when you actually get into the math, um, what the result comes out is that when, when, you, when you look at, at this, this energy from a quantitative perspective, um, the result is what you find out is that uh, the energy of electrons can only exist in certain amounts. So if you think about um, uh, the metaphor I always like to use is like the slide on a playground. Um, so you and I can can basically have any amount of energy. Um, we can we're like the slide part of the slide. We can um, you know if you imagine a lot of energy at the top and not very much energy at the bottom. Um, I'm very much a morning person, so I start at the top of the slide and gradually throughout the day I go down until the end, and I have no more energy anymore um, unless I do a fun interview like this. But uh, Electrons are not like that. Electrons can't have any old amount of energy. Um, electrons are like the rung part of the slide, the latter part of the slide. So electrons can only have energy corresponding to certain levels, like the rungs of a ladder. Now, there are differences between the rungs of a ladder and the energy levels of an electron um, in an atom. But, uh, but that's kind of the idea, is that uh, electrons can only exist uh, in certain energy states. And so that's something that's really interesting that comes out of the math that you really can't get to qualitatively um, with this equation. So uh, I think that was at a higher level than a three-year-old, but that's my explanation. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, it's hard to break this down for a three-year-old. <laughs> yes. To make it easy. And we'll have to introduce the concept of three-year-olds don't know what an atom is. So like, I, I, where do we even start? Yeah. But no, I like, I like your whole point also about um, how we make things too simple. And I think that also partially comes from, from like, we think that we tell people that they can't do science unless they're scientists. And then so they were like, oh, what you have to learn has to be the simplified version. And that's not true. Like you could not be a scientist and you could totally understand how this works. You could mm -hmm. have no basic math and know what's going on. Yeah, I think it's both, right? It's like, there, it's, it's this weird like intimidation of what you just said that like you have to know everything but then at the same time it's also this weird um uh what's the word i'm looking for arrogance i guess that you do know everything even though you only know this tiny amount it's like this it's very bizarre and i feel like they probably um feed off of each other in some way that if we could make one of them healthy probably the other one would be healthier too um yeah, yeah. No, I like that. I just, I'm so happy you brought that up because like, that's something I've thought about too. And I'm like, you know, 
like I wish people knew more and also I wish people were less scared to go and learn more and I wish but also I wish that teachers and educators were more willing to share more and not underestimate Mm -hmm. because like every I guarantee you everyone in this meeting could with enough time and patience understand everything about the Schrodinger equation it might take some of us a little bit longer than others based on our background and our history but like we can all do it absolutely Yeah, I think the only thing holding anyone back is the span of a lifetime. We can't learn everything that there is to know in the span of a lifetime. But absolutely, if you took the math classes and then you took the physics classes, uh, you could absolutely any. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Anyone could could get there. Not everyone needs to get there because everyone is living their own lives and that's okay. (laughs) Okay, I have a question because it got axed from the question list. Huh? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh. Do it. <laughs> what? Okay. I need your honest answer. What are your thoughts on gnomes? Are they scary? Do you think they're cute? Another word? Gnomes? No. Like garden gnomes? Garden gnomes. Or no, how different are gnomes than gargoyles? <laughs> gargoyles are better. <laughs> they're better. Well, I mean, really, what is what is the difference actually? I don't really think there is one. I think one is one a is... creepy old man and the other one's like a dragon-esque thing that protects okay. the house. <laughs> Maybe it could also be like one's French, one's English. Mm, okay, Maybe. okay. I don't know. I just, I found that question and I was like, this is golden. Even if they don't ask it, I have to ask it. One has a whole cartoon series about it. So that's pretty cool. And movies. Yeah. <laughs> it, was an, it was a 90s cartoon and it was amazing. I know. I'm assuming those were gnomes. Gargoyles. Gargoyles. Oh. Hey, there's what? a gnomes movie apparently too. Yeah, That's the gnomes have like multiple movies. I think they have like three at this point. Yeah, but it's Steve Gargoyles. <laughs> Gnomeo and Juliet in the 90s. Yeah, they just have like a really solid storyline. And <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, does Gnomeo and Juliet? As Susan and I are aging ourselves right now. <laughs> you guys are going off the rails here. <laughs> All so right. I, I'm sure that my answer would be different if I had seen these uh, pieces of cinema. Um, I don't have much of an opinion. I'm not going to put a gnome or a gargoyle in anything that I decorate, uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to judge anyone who does. I think that is a very great and valid answer. Absolutely. I love that. I just, I had to ask it. I was dying. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I tried. I tried. <laughs> um, so does anybody in the audience have any questions you would like to ask? Uh, just a reminder that this is being recorded. It is going to be posed. So if you do say something, your camera will pop up. So if you do have any questions, you can either turn it off, mute it, whatever you would like to do. Okay. I guess I have a question. Um, I'm contemplating, you're going to, you are going to eat this up. I'm contemplating going back to ASU after I graduate with my biochem degree for physics. Yes, and I so highly recommend. Do I need, like, <laughs> what mental preparation do I need to, like, do for that? Oh, that's a good question. That was not what I was <laughs> expecting. Um, it, it, I think that you're very much prepared because of the things that you've said, that you already know not to um, compete with other people and uh you know and to I I mean I wish I had known that like the environment is extremely competitive I think my hunch is less so online um the students are a little bit older and maybe more mature but like when I went through it I like I always thought I was a competitive person um until I got into a room with 118 year old boys uh and then I was like oh I'm not nearly as competitive as I thought (laughs) um or something else no, it's no shade. Maybe oh, it's no, no it's... Shade. But, um, yes. <laughs> but they will learn, they will mature. Because um, okay. I'm, I'm really enticed to do it because like I could do it online. I would only need to do about a year of schooling. I'd only need like 30 credits. And then I could also do the master's in material science. I think you should do totally do it. Soon. Yeah. So do I was, I've, I've been thinking about it and I was like, I know exactly who I'm going to ask. And I'm going to be seeing her for a tour of electron microscopes. <laughs> And there are so many more resources now than there were when I was learning it. Like if I think that's the other thing that I try to tell my students too, is that the best way to learn physics is to hear it from a variety of perspectives. And you could totally do that now. 
now you have YouTube, you've got a million open source textbooks. Um, I mean, the ASU library is great. It's always been great, but there's so many more things that are digitized now. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, having, having some maturity and um, availing yourself to a lot of different resources. I think those would be my, my two biggest pieces of advice. <clears throat> Okay. Then when you get, when you finish the degree, then you're going to have to tell me what else, what else you needed. Okay. I mean, honestly, I think what you say is like probably exactly it. I'm used to the whole you, chemistry and physics. They go hand in hand. Like they cover different stuff, but at the end of the day, it's like the same level of grit. <laughs> so, and like I, these people have heard me talk about it so much. I tell everyone to take inorganic chemistry. You knew it, oh, yeah. you knew it was coming, Alex. It is such a cool class it is it's great because it breaks all the assumption that all the gen and ochem classes make it's that whole uh, like what you were talking about the whole people can handle more and but we also need to acknowledge that we don't know everything and that was like so that was such a cool class to me because I was like I didn't know any of this but now I do and now I can understand more about the world and why some things do what they do mm -hmm. and if you like inorganic material science, there's a lot of overlap there. Oh, no, I, I love the whole MO theory, all that kind of stuff like that. That just like tickles my brain in the right way. All right. Um, there is a question from the audience. Um, are there any physics projects or experiments that you are looking forward to in the next five years? Oh, yes. So I, I'm i working on a um, putting together a grant proposal for um, it's actually more physics education than, than straight physics, but, um, I, uh, basically I have written all my own problems, um, since I started, since I got my own classroom. And the reason for that was I was really, really tired of problems about cars. Like if I never see another physics problem about a car, it will be too soon. Um, and so I actually kind of did a, um, brief survey of one of the major textbooks that we use and that a lot of universities use. And in the kinematics section, so basically the study of motion, um, so like probably almost half, well, I don't, I, I, I don't want to be quantitative because I can't remember the exact numbers, but so many problems. The top two topics were cars and sports. Um, and no, not a single problem about like a wheelchair, um, not a single problem about throwing a cheerleader in the air, um, not a single problem about like throwing uh, an eggshell in a trash can. Um, so like all the boy cliches and none of the girl cliches. Um, and, and we know that boy cliches don't fit all boys either. So like it's, I think it's a problem because um, you know, when I, I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's kind of a microaggression, I think, because it's one of many small messages that tells you you don't belong. Um, and, you know, I, I can say, um, like these problems were very clearly written with one particular type of person in mind, and that person isn't me. And I think a lot of people would say that person isn't me. Um, uh, of all genders, I think would say that. And, that's a problem. So um, the the proposal that so so I've always tried to write my own, and I've done a better job um, than than that. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of people that th th there are, there are a lot of situations that I can't represent either because I'm also just one person. Um, and it would be I think it would not be a great idea for me to even try to represent some situations because that um, really it should come from from um own voices right it, people who actually have those experiences should be the one writing the problems so that's exactly what i want to do is put together a project um that does that and uh, our student body is more diverse than our faculty body so the idea is that students will write problems um based on their own experience and um and it doesn't have to be like based on our identities it can also be like you know um someone has a tattoo, they can write a problem about a tattoo. Um, so just way more broad than, uh, than cars and sports. <laughs> and 
uh, oh, I love this. Nicoletta saying we need some <coughs> problems about walking in heels down a slope and the trajectory of a wig snatch. <laughs> I think yes. you had a death drop into that too. But also I can vouch for your textbook writing skills. You do a great job because I had to read it for your Thank class. You. And it was Thank a good, you. it was a good, like you can come in not knowing anything. It gets you up to speed enough. You know enough of what's going on to take that next step. Yeah. Like, yeah. Thank you. So yeah. So anyway, in a nutshell, this is my goal is to have um, students write problems and then uh, me and another um, faculty would kind of look at them and say, okay, but from a pedagogical perspective, can we like change, can we edit it this way? And the student would say, yes, that works. That keeps the heart of the problem or no, it doesn't. So then we have to come up with some solution. Um, and so basically we would put together a, a much more inclusive problem set um, and then publish it online open source for, um, and I, I would write all the solutions. Yeah, and then we would open it up so that everyone could have access to that. And hopefully a lot more people would see themselves in physics problems and feel like they belong. Have you had any um, pedagogical training since you mentioned that? That's a good question. Not much, uh, okay. just lots of experience. Okay. Um, Cause I know that like I, a lot of professors don't get that. It's true. I've, I've taught somewhere in the realm of like 60 to 70 courses. So I kind of got it um, that way and in a really, in a fairly short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always what? tutored and stuff, but I, I think I took, Sorry, continue. What? Well, I took I took one. I was just going to say my my training is that I took one course about uh, that was offered at the community colleges. That's okay. a prerequisite to teaching at the community colleges, and it's about different learning styles and stuff. When you started teaching, was that kind of like eye opening to you? And like, wow, like did did that like completely change a lot of stuff for you? Like both teaching wise and like other things. Because I, I had always tutored and I don't know why okay. it, it never really dawned on me. Like, I remember even asking my mom if I could teach my younger sister to read. And I don't know why, it, like, it, and we, like I volunteered because I was pre-med, I volunteered at the hospital. And my favorite thing to do was like take people on tours and like show them where stuff was. And it just never clicked with me that like, maybe you should teach. <laughs> um, but it felt very normal. So I don't think anything changed when I, when I got my own classroom or when I, before that, when I became a TA. I mean, that makes the best kinds of teachers, the ones who are naturals at it. So I, I've also had to work. I think that actually, I think, I think that I teach physics because I struggle with physics. And I think that's what makes me um, It motivates me to break it down teacher. for people who exactly. are in the same place that you do. And you're like, hey, I did this and I was in your spot. You can do it too. Oh and I had to break it down to teach it to myself. Like, I don't think I would be a very good math teacher because math comes fairly easily to me. That's how I made it through physics is because math um, came easily to me. But uh, but I, I have a hard time teaching math because I'm like, oh, I don't know how to like, you know, I don't know if you don't, if you don't get it this way, I don't know how to like. You're like, it just works. I don't know how it just does. <laughs> That's the answer. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I like I have that. A couple questions, if you don't mind, Mason, if you're finished. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so yeah, um, I really enjoyed the interview. Um, would have loved to have taken your physics class. Um, I not too late. <laughs> yeah, too. It's, it's <laughs> still okay. can. Um, are you going to be doing uh your uh the class that Mason took, or is that going to be taught again? Yes. Um, I just need to, I need to confirm that we have use of a microscope, but I um like ninety percent yes. And um, ooh, that's actually really exciting. Um, and then kind of going back and since it, this wasn't a question that you were pretty prepared for, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, um, but I'm a, hopefully going to medical school. So I'm just curious about your journey between um, wanting to be a doctor and seeing physics and what made that pop. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that they, I don't know that I chose physics over being a doctor. I think I chose writing over being a doctor. Um, and, and especially when I thought I was going to go the TV route, like I, you can't be both, like you can be a novelist and be anything else, but like TV writing is its own 
career. So I was like, I think this is the career I'm choosing. And I don't know why, though. I think, you know, when I came back, I guess I could have picked pre-med back up. But but yeah, I did physics instead. Um, maybe it was math. I don't, I don't know. That's a really great question. Um, I haven't really thought about that. I do also, Maybe. Have, like, I love that the fact that ASU is so um, inclusive and trying to include everybody, because then it brings people like you, where you thought you were going to do writing, and you didn't really, you were like, meh, I'm not going to do science. And then you did do science, but now you have these writing skills, and now you're taking those writing skills and using it to write an open source textbook for science. Like, that is so cool when you take everyone who wants to be a scientist, and as long as they're willing to put in the effort, like... You get all you get all these kinds of interesting people that have unique skill sets that are beyond solving science problems. <laughs> yes, exactly. I had a student this uh, this past spring who um, I think was like a dancer and was like wanted to do this interdisciplinary thing between like dancing and physics or musical theater and physics. And I and I agree, it's great that ASU does this and. Uh, and it brings so much more to the table. Like, I can't wait to see what she does with her career. Oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal that there. I just popped in my head ADHD. I was like, oh my God, I got to say this. I don't know. Well, I did. <laughs> she answered all of my questions. So if anyone else has any more, please jump in. I did have a question uh, specifically. Uh, how can we know when it gets published? Because I do want to read it. Uh, thank you. No, so, okay, so my, um, it's taken me a long time to write it. And I'm trying to be gentle with myself because I'm like, you have a lot of other things going on. Um, can we get I, on my hunch list? What's that? Can we get on a like subscription list? Like, it's so if you go to alisonbully.com, there is a mailing list. Say less. <laughs> I think it, my hunch is it will come out next June. Um, that's my goal right now, because I do want some time to edit it and uh, get some sensitivity readers. That's so exciting. If you want help from us, let us know. I would be willing to help, and I'm sure we can find peeps and ideas who would love to help out too. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. too many humans to not ask. In here. Free right. copies, free copies. <laughs> I went ahead and put the link in the Zoom chat for you guys to click and check out. Nice. Um, so does, I'm pretty sure, is, does anybody have any other questions or anything they would like to add? Does Dr. Boley have any questions for us? Some curveballs. <laughs> I want to know how this came about because this is so amazing and so organized. And it's like my perception is that it is really student led and student initiated. Um, so I'm really curious about how this organization came about. Yeah. Um, so Idea Student Society is basically, it started off as a society for biological and bio, um, chemistry majors online. And then as it slowly passed down from leader to leader, it got uh, created in 2019. And as it got to last year, we were like, we should open it up. We should broaden this to STEM in general and not just a few select majors. Why don't we just open this up for all of sciences so we can advocate for a lot of people because they all kind of mingling together. You can't have biology without chemistry. You can't have chemistry without physics. You can't have physics without biology. It's just, it's a circle. Um, so it is student ran everything. Uh, we do have a faculty advisor, uh, Dr. Austin, who kind of oversees us, makes sure we're not messing up. And, you know, I, I, Captain, we're, we're being good. We're behaving. Um, so we are all organized and as, as, you know, as good as possible. <laughs> That's like, again, it's that whole like inclusive thing of ASU is like we all have passions outside of school and what we want to do. Like I love science, but I also love graphic design and photography. So I get to bring that into ideas through doing the advertising and the branding and like designing the logo and like all that kind of stuff. But like, you know, if you don't include everyone like that, it, it 
you know, you start losing all those unique features about people. Mm -hmm. You know, Alex is a mastermind at running this. She is like, between her and Susan, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they stay sane, but they do. <laughs> it's, and then we got Donina. Donina is Ms. Communication. Like, <laughs> I love it. She is on top of everything. You tell her to send something, it's in the general chat in 30 seconds. I mean, you know, working at Disneyland and then working for charity groups that have to do communication a lot. You get yeah. it. Yeah. And so and we get it. We have a bunch of like Nicolette. Nicolette has done an awesome job with recruitment. Like she made whole recruitment um like intro presentation. So when we have our weekly events, like there's a whole intro, like, hey, welcome. This is what ideas is. This is what we do. Come hang out with us. Like we all just get to bring what we love to do and turn it into a cool science club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have um, a total of, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think nine officers, executive and actual like on the board officers. And they all have, most of us have different majors. I think only a few of us share the same, like me and Susan are both biomed, but for the most part, everybody's all different and all have these huge different goals, but they all, we all somehow were like, I took a class with you like three years ago. <laughs> So like it all comes right back together. Um, and we got some little birds in our ear saying that you'd be great to interview because everybody loved your classes, loved everything you're doing. And I'm like, that's it. Emailing straight away. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how this all came to came together. <laughs> it's really amazing. And tagging on that, if you have recommendations for other professors who you think would want to interview, please let mm -hmm. us know because we are a little sure. limited. Um, I mean, obviously we would love to do people who teach online, but they don't necessarily have to teach online if they just want to, you know, talk about what they do and how that can, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, you also get online professors who have been switched to teaching on campus as well. So we could get that experience and ask them about what it's like to do both at the same time. So if you have any ideas, let us know. <laughs> Cause we want to keep, we want to try to keep doing these kind of interview things. Cause they're so fun. Like mm -hmm. amazingly. And if the first one goes as smoothly, like the rest are going to be great too. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, we want to thank you um, for coming and especially on this very this short noticed interview. <laughs> so we really <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> um, so yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.